got up oh. ah, huh? yes. so everybody got up early on Saturday. Thank yeah. you. Kind of early. Can you guys see the lamp? Hang on. Okay, good. Uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, let me give you a brief introduction first. Okay. Okay. I will do it on the other side. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the 4 IITS Positive Neuroscience Seminar. Uh, today our topic is What makes a creative mind? Insights from neuroscience. And as you know, Professor Kaufman is a well-known expert, a well-known expert in, on creativity research. Um, right now, Professor Kaufman is a professor of educational psychology at the University of Connecticut. Uh, and he is also the current president, uh, the current president of the American Creativity uh, Association. Mm -hmm. Professor Kaufman uh, has won many academic awards and has published a lot of uh, books and papers. And, and also, he co-founded two major journals, Psychology of uh, Aesthetics, Creativity and the Arts, and also the psychology of popular uh, media culture. Um, do you have anything more to add? Nope. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we are delighted and uh, so grateful that uh, to have uh, Professor Kaufman uh, to share his brain with us, uh, to share his knowledge with us. And also we are very grateful because uh, last week Professor Kaufman uh, has a uh, bad cold. And two days ago, he, he was still taking anti antibiotics. And uh, we keep praying, uh, keep you in our thoughts and prayer. It looks like you look quite good. Are you okay? Or still? Are you... Um, I got my voice back. Okay, okay, okay. So, oh. thank you. So much. Thank you so much. So, right now, we will pass, uh, give our big applause to uh, Professor Kaufman, and then we will pass the time to Professor Kaufman. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. So looks like people have the PowerPoints, um, which is good. Um, so I always start by defining creativity, and I've included a couple of cartoons that are harder to uh, use without actually showing the uh, PowerPoint, but In essence, people usually, when they think about creativity, think about something new, something different and novel, even unique. And indeed, that is part of creativity. But it's not all there is. So what if you were to hire somebody to pave your driveway, to build a um, area for your car to park on. And they used pounds and pounds of salami or bacon or raw meat. That would be really new. It would be unlike any other driveway that anybody else has. But after a few days, it wouldn't work. It would smell really bad. It would, your car would start sinking. And as a result, that is not something that creativity researchers would consider to be creative. It would be new. It would be different. But it wouldn't be creative. Similarly, if you ask me to tell you a creative story, and I say, once upon a time, can people hear me? I just want to make sure. Okay, make sure. Um, and I say, once upon a time, something happened, the end. That's not creative because nothing happens. It's, it's not new. But if, I, if you were to ask me to tell you a creative story, and I said, once upon a time, a lot of elephants trampled all around the rhubarb, stepping all over the red fire ants, 
on every single major U.S. holiday, leading to George Washington emerging unscathed from a volcano. The end. That is different. You've probably never heard those words together in your life, I hope. But again, we would call that new, but it's not task appropriate. Because that's the second part of creativity. In addition to being new and original, it has to be in some way relevant, useful, and that can vary wildly. So if it's something like interpretive dance, then theoretically there's a very wide range of what could be appropriate. But for many things, there is a relatively narrow range. I mean, right now I'm giving a talk about creativity rooted in the brain. If I were to talk about ballet for two hours, that wouldn't be creative. It would just be not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. It would also be really boring because I don't know anything about ballet. So there's a couple of models that kind of help the way we see creativity. One of the most well-known is the four Ps. And it's really a framework of how to even consider studying or thinking about creativity. So one is the creative person. <clears throat> that tends to be a lot more of my focus. What makes us creative? What distinguishes a creative person from somebody who maybe is less creative? Or somebody who is creative in one area from somebody who's creative in a different area? There's a the creative process. <clears throat> and sometimes this is studied as the creative problem-solving process, where we look at different stages of creativity, everything from recognizing what a problem is to be solved, to thinking of how to solve it, to picking the best solution, to then actually trying to carry that out. In addition, a lot of the work on creativity in the brain is on the creative process. Typically, they are looking at the brain while, I, while they have somebody doing a creative activity. There's the creative product, and this is anything from a painting to a scientific equation to a new invention to an idea. And then there's the creative press. And it really should be the creative environment, but then it wouldn't be the four Ps. So press is kind of an awkward word for the environment. And that's everything from the physical environment, so the, the desks that you're sitting at right now, to a more psychological environment. So whether you're encouraged by your supervisor or professor to be creative, whether you're given a chance to express yourself, um, the structure of the company or the school, for example. And in fact, more recently, there's been some work splitting the environment into two aspects. One of them is more about resources. So what tools are you given, whether it is money or access to materials or time or anything like that. The other is more about the audience or the people that you interact with. So this could be everything from the people that you brainstorm with to a mentor to eventually anybody that you talk to and want to share your, cre your creativity with. Another model is the four C's, and this one me and Ron Baghetto are, are guilty of. It looks at creativity as a developmental trajectory where we start with mini C, and this is personal creativity. It's things 
that give us meaning and it could be a sudden insight we have or an idea and it doesn't matter if other people see that it's creative. It could stay up here in our heads even. The key with mini C is it's kind of like the very, the very beginning. It's the germ of the idea. It's that insight. It's what a lot of students go through learning topics for the first time. So if you have a young student learning algebra for the first time, algebra has already been discovered. And whatever work on algebra they do will not be traditionally new because we know a great deal about it. But they're creating their own analogies, metaphors, they're discovering it. And that process is the building blocks of creativity. With feedback and with growth comes what we call little c or everyday creativity. This is creativity that is of interest to other people. So if you go to a small store that sells wood carvings or, or small um, handmade crafts, it may not be professional, but it's something that people enjoy. It could be a, a creative and interesting meal that other people like eating. So it's mini C if you just make it for yourself and you enjoy it. If somebody else, ideally little people, also like it, it's kind of gone up a little bit. With time, with practice, with experience comes pro C. And this is professional expert level creativity. This is starting to contribute to a field. This is potentially something that could be your profession. It doesn't have to be. It could be a, a, a hobby that you're very, very um, passionate and, and intense about and have done a lot of work on, but it's also often what we end up doing and the creativity on the job. And finally, there is Big C. And Big C is creative genius. This is the creativity that lasts for centuries after the creator may be gone. This is Mozart, Shakespeare. This is Einstein, you know, that level of creativity. I'm going to go through an example of mini C and then kind of transition over the course of a potential career. So there's a show in America that was in the 80s called, called MacGyver. Has anybody heard of MacGyver? It wasn't that good, um, but it's about this guy named MacGyver who can make almost anything at the last minute out of whatever he has at hand. So there'll be some emergency. So somebody will have a heart attack and he will take candlesticks. He'll take some wires. He'll take a floor pad and he'll make a makeshift um, cardiac machine, you know, the the. the electric you know, pulses that bring somebody out of a heart attack. He'll develop a way to defuse a bomb at the last minute. It's with all of these in the moment insights, and yet it's an example of how you can not be a student and still experience and use mini C. So Velcro, which you know kind of works on this type of a system where you have the, the soft fur or hair and you have the little wires. The guy who invented it got the idea when he was taking a walk in the woods with his dog, who was a big husky and had a lot of fur. And he was 
picking the burrs, these sharp, round objects, off of the fur, and he realized, this is sticking pretty well. And this could have just been a mini C idea if he had never done anything with it. But he was a scientist, and he began playing with it, and he invented Velcro, which, if you've ever had trouble tying your shoes, can be really, really helpful. The same way something that starts out as a, as a hobby, carving faces out of potatoes, can go to little c when you share it with people, and if you keep plugging away, and you eventually become recognized as an expert in even something a little esoteric or odd, again, you can kind of keep going. A couple of other um, concepts about creativity. One big one is that there exists what's called an art bias, which is that most people tend to think of creativity as being just in the arts. This is particularly true for kids. But I know when I work with a lot of my students, I ask them if they're creative and they say no, because they don't paint or write poetry or play an instrument. You can be creative at Almost anything, certainly, you know, science, business, everyday life. I mean, there's very few things that you can't be creative at. You may not be pro or big C level, but there's that potential. Another way of looking at creativity across domains and this idea of how you can be creative in so many different areas and what we know about that is there's a, um, the amusement park theory, which uses the metaphor of going to an amusement park, which isn't the best metaphor, but we came up with it early and it stuck. The idea is that You start with initial requirements. So for an amusement park, if you want to go there, you need tickets or else they're not going to let you in. You need a ride or a uh, way to take the bus or the train or a car. You probably need some money, not just the ticket, but you know, you want to buy food or whatever. Once you've passed those initial requirements, you get to more of a general thematic area. And these are these very large concepts. So do you want to go to a park that's more of a theme park, like Disney? Do you want to go to a park that's more focused on roller coasters, like really hardcore roller coasters or, or a water slide? Or do you want to go to an amusement park that's more animal focused? Even beyond that, if you keep going down, you have domains. So if you choose Disney World, you still have a lot of choices. So there's Epcot, the Magic Kingdom, Animal Kingdom, Tomorrowland, Fantasyland. And underneath that, you have micro domains. So even if you've chosen, you still have which ride you go on to. The equivalent for creativity is that there are certain basic things that are needed to reach a certain level of creativity. So a certain amount of intelligence. I don't mean being incredibly smart, but the ability to formulate your ideas, the ability to articulate your ideas. You need motivation. Creativity takes effort. And if it's something you don't want to do and you're not being made to do it, you're not going to do it. It requires a very basic environment. Um, doesn't need to be incredibly nurturing, 
although that would be good, but it has to at least allow creativity. General thematic areas are these really kind of larger concepts, you know, science, art, writing, business, these kind of very large concepts. Underneath each one, so science, you know, it says in the slides, you know, physics, chemistry, biology, psychology. Going under psychology, even there you have the micro domains, clinical, social, developmental, educational. And that at each level, we know something about the people who are both interested and often the best suited to these areas. So if you look at art, artists tend to be less conscientious. They tend to be more open to new experiences and particularly experiential. They tend to have higher visual spatial ability if it's more painting or sculpture. Business tends to be much more conscientious, much more, much more analytical, much more applied. So there are, are different personality traits, cognitive strengths, and just generally different strengths that are patterned around different broad areas. But this also goes all the way down to micro domains. So if you look, if you think about clinical versus cognitive psychology, for clinical, you would need to be higher on emotional intelligence, empathy, cognitive, more fluid intelligence, or the ability to problem solve, the ability to analyze. Similarly, if you compare writers, a journalist and a novelist are very similar in a lot of ways, but there have been studies that have found journalists tend to be more extroverted, journalists tend to be more extrinsically motivated, so motivated by more external goals, novelists tend to be more motivated by intrinsic goals or interest. So even at this level, there is still this type of this type of detail and distinguishing elements. So one implication is that when we say science, what do we mean? Do we mean broad science? Are we really talking about biology? Are we talking about something really specific like animal cognition? That each of these things. If we're talking about, okay, I want to be creative in this area, a lot depends on what level of area we're talking about. At a larger level, a lot of creativity consultants or people who want to be more creative take the position that creativity is general. And so if you are a business owner and you hire somebody to consult and tell you how to be more creative, they will often have you do things in the arts. So they'll have you paint or sing. The problem is that it doesn't really transfer. So you might become a better painter. You won't necessarily become a more creative business person. In general, if you want to be creative at something, the Biggest thing is to keep doing that thing and practicing. Are there any questions so far before I go on? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi. Hello. Um, I, I see that you, you, you mentioned about it's, it's almost like um, creativity is a process of becoming, almost like uh, uh, both learn and also obviously is uh, what you're talking about, personality and all, all the combination of commission and, and all the link up of wiring. And, and the becoming is, is almost like until you 
in the shape of the way and practice uh, a lot in certain type of domain or cross domains, the creativity will not flourish. Uh, something like that. And 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 and, and my, my thinking is how that relating to the concept of flow. Flow the concept of it's almost like you practice, 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 and becoming something part of you. And, and that can be very technical, but creativity also needing something seems to be an extra element in order to make that happen. Uh, is, it, is it that cognitive? Is it the spatial? Is it, or maybe you don't talk about that in, in the brain area anyway. Some of it is that in order to hit flow, it needs to be a little bit harder than what you can do. So if you want to, um, sorry, my dog is barking downstairs and as I am trying for her. Um, so if, for example, you want If you want to be creative at a lowish level, then you can enter flow without having a lot of the technical know-how or – but as you keep going, and particularly if you want, you know, I don't just want to write a short story for my own sake. I want to really write a novel that gets published and people will like. That's where the technical stuff and where the cognitive abilities – start becoming more and more appropriate, but you still can hit flow as you go up. So the same way that if you play the piano really well and you just do, you know, bump, 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 the basic chopsticks type thing, you're not going to enter flow. But if you play the piano okay and you try doing an incredibly complex piece, you're just going to stumble at it. Flow is also an amazing intrinsic motivator. So certain intrinsic motivation is generally, generally related to creativity, but it is more related to some domains than others. And so the experience of flow is a little more important for some domains. It's important for all of them. But like, if you look at a lot of the arts, um, intrinsic motivation tends to be tied a little stronger. And so the ability to go into flow is m that much more important. In, I mean, all domains feed off it, but I think it's importance can either be important or very, very important, if that makes sense. Did that address? I think so. All right. I, I, I guess I, I, I guess I understand what you're talking about. Uh, this, this, this also seems to me creativity is. Uh, a more, I mean, flow can be technically flow and pro, and then it seems to me creativity is more integration with different domain in a very com complicated uh, uh, level. Uh, when you're talking about the little C and the big C, let's say the big C would have to be more integration of many, many different complexities whereby the little C is one particular micro domain of one thing and then it creates some flow because you practice and become and becoming. And then and, creativity and is more in, when you talk about big C. Am I something in that direction? I mean, the C's and the spec... So even at the, even at the micro domain, in a sense, any as you increase on the sea level, you tend to get more specific. 
so at the mini sea level when you're kind of figuring it out, you might be at the larger general thematic areas. Um, but as you keep getting better and better and better, you actually are probably going to get more specific. And I mean, the same way, I mean, when I was an undergrad, I knew I either wanted to do psychology or creative writing. In grad school, it narrowed to cognitive psych. My first two years, I was still exploring cognitive psych and I was terrible at it. I discovered you could actually study creativity in my third year. And as I've gone on, it's even gotten more specific within creativity. So things like creativity assessment, which is like a micro, micro, micro domain in some ways. Um, it takes both parts in, in terms of the, the technical and the more flow aspect. As in, in, in a sense, like the beginning of flow is, is the novelty aspect. It takes the technical bits to keep the task appropriate, workable, functioning. Um, so if you don't have that initial spark, newness, then the technical aspects matter less. But if you do and you want it to be great, that's when it kind of kicks in more. Another way of looking at, create, at, at creativity, and I promise this won't all just be another way of looking at creativity, is to look at and this is more pro C, big C, to look at how a creative work interacts with the domain or micro domain, depending on how you want it. Um, so for example, the most basic, but still often important level of creativity is replication. Have you ever been to an art museum and you've seen somebody in the corner, like sketching their own version of the Mona Lisa? Um, they're basically replicating that work. It's they're not creating their own painting, but it's still their own painting and that they're doing it themselves. Or the way that a lot of pharmacies, you'll have one company that discovers a new drug and immediately a lot of other pharmacies will make a generic cheaper version of it, which on one hand probably annoys the original pharmaceutical company, but it also makes the drug affordable to the vast majority of people. It's taking something that's already known and basically recreating it. A lot of movie sequels are this. So they've made the first movie and it made money and the goal of the second movie is to be as close to the first movie as humanly possible to get people to go see it again. Not all sequels are like this, of course, but the ones that just want to. There's redefinition, which is when you take something <coughs> existing or old and you put a new spin on it. Um, Post-it notes are a great example where at the 3M company, this guy had invented a glue that didn't stick. And that's kind of an important component of glue. And it stayed there for a year. Nobody knew what to do with it. This different employee at the company, a guy named Art Fry, took it home. And he realized that it did stick, just not permanently. And so he used it to put hymns in his hymn book for singing. And he could glue it in and then take it off. And when he brought this to his boss, they realized this could be marketed. And that's how post-it notes 
came about where this thing that existed and wasn't really being used was reanalyzed, you know, was reused and they found a different use for it. Another one is there was a drug called thalidomide that in the 1960s was used for nausea in pregnant women and it caused birth defects. And it obviously was stopped being used. In the last decade, they found that it can actually help some cancer treatments. And so this drug that had been an example of the worst possible drug that you could have, that it wasn't tested well enough, fast forward 40 years, and they're finding this new use for it, obviously not for women who are pregnant, and there is this question of, well, should you be doing this? Should you look at things that maybe didn't work or even caused harm and see, can you find another use for it? Then there are incrementations. This is when you see where the domain is going and you bump it forward a little bit. So, how many of you heard of the show CSI, Crime, Crime Scene Investigation? Once that became popular, every single network, some did replications. They tended to not be as successful. But other ones took it a little step further. So, some of them, did it with a forensic anthro did it with forensic anthropology, which became bones. Another show did it with a coroner. Oh, and that was Crossing Jordan. And so they would do the same type of crime show with this analytic component, and they would keep changing a little bit. It's the same way that after the show Lost, there were a lot of adventure mythology shows, usually changing just enough to push things forward. So right now, there's a show called Manifest that has just started in America that we've only seen a pilot, but we love it. It's basically lost, except 15, 20 degrees moving forward, but it's still moving forward. If you look at most published studies in psychology or education or anything, they tend to be forward incrementations. So we know that this works. What if we do it on a different population? What if we look at it and how it interacts with this other variable? There are small steps forward, they're important, but they're small steps. There's also advanced forward incrementation. And that's when the field's going, the domain's going this way, and you go two steps ahead. This is when people tend not to be ready for it. And so you tend to not get a whole lot of appreciation right then, but you fast forward a while and people will eventually catch up. Another type is integration, which is basically taking two domains and kind of smushing them together. So in the 50s and 60s, there were a lot of Westerns about these people who were exploring the Old West and they would go from town to town and they would meet different people and they would help them out, they would fall in love. What Gene Roddenberry did was he took that idea and he put it in space. And that's Star Trek. It's them going from planet to planet instead of from city to city. But it's the same basic premise, except in space. If you look at a lot of the classic samurai movies, a lot of Akira Kurosawa's work, a lot of these concepts, the idea of a noble warrior seeking out destiny, the idea of the journey, the idea of the samurai sword, this long cylindric cylindrical weapon, they were put in space, and this was Star Wars. And if you 
go back and watch a lot of the classic Akira, Akira Kurosawa films, it's interesting just how much, even in terms of like angles, the original Star Wars borrowed from it. They're taking this idea, merging it with this idea in space, and it becomes this additional thing. And then there's reinitiation. And this is when you just say, okay, the domain is here, and I think we should be going all the way over here. You just hit reset. This is the first time that uh, Marcel Duchamp entered a urinal in an art exhibit and just said, this is art. I don't know how many of you saw in the news about Banksy last week or weeks ago. I mean, you have this art auction, painting, everything's kind of traditional, and then once they hit sale, it shreds itself. Nobody had ever done that before. It wasn't even, it wasn't just a new work of art. It was saying, no, I think art can be destroyed art for the sake of art. And some people, of course, thought this is stupid. I mean, you're just destroying your own work. And other people thought, this is, you know, this is a commentary on art itself. I mean, whether you agree or disagree, it's just taking art and it's doing that. So, where is creativity in terms of the brain? Uh, one part is if you look at the prefrontal cortex, that's where you have the higher thought, cognition, decision making, movement. One of the biggest uses is that is how we figure out if we're looking at something new. And this is something that we find in humans and in animals in this area. So if you have an animal, one the very first step in a sense, is if you put something new in its enclosure, does it realize it's new? Or does it just assume it's always been there? If we can't recognize what is new, we probably aren't going to be able to create new. It's figuring out the best words to tell a story. It's the more analytic part of creativity. Then you have the hippocampus, memory, learning, this is the memory involved in creativity. It's not a huge part, but remembering the notes that you play in a piece of music, remembering your lines as an actor. It also helps us if we know an object, we're in this new situation, it helps us use that object. So, if you've ever used a wire hanger to break into your car or somebody else's car, but hopefully your car, um, you may not have used you you may not have used it for this purpose before, but your familiarity with a wire hanger and the way you can unravel it is how the hippocampus can help with that. Or Really, any time you're taking something familiar, using it for a new purpose. The basal ganglia, which are back here, part of learning, a lot of emotion, motor control, the way that we interact, control and emotional expressions, such as dance. Part of it, which is the, the ventral striatum, is more involved in motivation, such as seeking rewards, avoiding harm, 
when we get an increase in dopamine, this is the part that want us to go and seek out new things. If it's depending on the person, that can be thrill seeking and wanting to go on a scary roller coaster, or it could be at a much smaller level and just wanting to try a new experience or ordering a new dish at a restaurant. Then you have the cerebellum. That helps you plan movement, coordination. It helps us model creative behavior. So if you see somebody else doing something creative, and then you want to try that and eventually, hopefully, put your own spin on it, that's the core part. Its role in planning is also very important. A lot of problem solving uses planning. Planning abilities tend to be one of the intellectual components that is associated with creativity. There's been surprisingly little work about this, actually, but the studies that exist link planning and creativity in the cerebellum. Something that I spend a lot of time thinking about um, is why creativity. My very first job out of graduate school was working for Educational Testing Service. They're the ones who develop um, most of the standardized tests, TOEFL, GREs, not the SATs, which is College Board, but College Board and the ETS are like this. I had an idea about how to measure creativity using a measure they already had. And I run up to my boss, and I'm really excited. Imagine me like 25 years ago with hair. Okay, a little bit of hair. Um, and I say, you know, hey, I think I know how we can measure creativity. And he looks at me, and all he says is, so? And I had no idea what to say. It never occurred to me that not everybody would be excited about this. And he continued on basically saying that he thought creativity was just a mistake when people measure intelligence. But that was fun. But if we think about it, we're in this we're in this world that promotes creativity and says we should be creative. Creativity takes time, costs money, takes up resources. If you're in education, then time spent on creativity or resources means you're not spending it on something else. Particularly with the way the market generally has been, at least here, it's kind of a zero-sum game. So if you're taking money and you're putting it toward nurturing creativity, you're taking it away from literacy or chess club or something like that. Certainly, I mean, I, I think it's worth it. Otherwise, I've been wasting a lot of time. There's some basic stuff that the workplace, creative people tend to be promoted more. They tend to make more. They're better at starting their own companies. They tend to be more satisfied with their careers. Interpersonally, they tend to have less personal stress, generally be in better mood, have a higher state of well-being. That said, it's something I think creativity researchers need to get better at, because right now we mostly show creativity in school performance and creativity in work performance. Other things predict those better. Grades, you know, how much money a company makes. That's more conscientiousness and intellect. Creativity helps. But creativity leads to a lot of other stuff in addition. Some of it is more long-term. 
as a species, we tend not to be good at long-term thinking, but it tends to lead to the longer-term growth and in innovation. I'll return a little bit to that. If we look at the creative problem problem solving process um, in terms of getting a little more applied, we usually kind of train to start by trying to solve a problem. Usually we're given problems to solve. At school, at work. But in real life, often, it's really more that there are symptoms. So, for example, if I tell you that there are mice in your basement, that's either a problem or it's just a fact. One way is to figure out how are you going to frame or find the problem. Is the problem that you need to get these mice out of your basement? Is the problem that you need to make sure that more mice don't come in? Those are different problems and you would solve them in different ways. Similarly, if you notice your heating bill is going up every month, you have to figure out what is the actual problem. Yes, it's a problem your heating bill is going up, but the problem could be that you are leaking heat. The problem could be that you're just really cold all the time. There's a lot of different problems and each one would have different solutions. I mean, if your friends always tell you that you dress terribly, one problem could be that you need to dress better. Another problem could be that you have really terrible friends and you need to find better friends. How you go about doing this is totally different depending on what you choose as the problem to solve. Once you've established, okay, I think this is the problem. That's when you start generating ideas. And I mean, to give you an example from last week on how if you pick the wrong problem, you can think of all the ideas you want. Last week I lost my voice. I assumed I just had a cold or laryngitis. And so I tried generating ideas. So I drank a lot of tea. I took some medicine for cough. And then two days ago, it went from my voice and circled all the way, all the way back to my head and I realized, okay, this isn't a cold or laryngitis, it turned out to be a sinus infection, which actually needed antibiotics. So while I was drinking tea and trying to treat my voice, I was solving the wrong problem. If I'd gone on antibiotics six days earlier, I would have a, more, a, a clearer voice right now. And it certainly wouldn't feel like everything is a little soggy. Idea generation is one of the kind of neatest aspects of creativity. It's one of the ones that is the easiest to train or to work on. So you ask open-ended questions. A lot of what ifs. What would happen if people had five arms? What would happen if people could fly? Um, or you can think about multiple uses. So if you take any object, you know, this, you know, clicker, what are all the things that you could use it for? I mean, you could use it as a clicker for the TV, but you could also use it as a paperweight. You could use it to hit your dog on the head with. You could use it as a projectile weapon. Um, you could use it to, as an armrest, that's a handrest. Um,
for the heat problem, let's say the side the, the problem is that my apartment has leaks somewhere and the heat is getting out. So you'd be generating ideas, you know, I could get spackle and, and or cement, I don't know, and go across every single area and make sure it's sealed in. I could use duct tape. I could call a professional because otherwise I will destroy my house. I will... This is a problem of using a more engineering example when you're not an engineer is you end up running out of generated ideas after about three. But come up with lots of different solutions and there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. So one is fluency, which is how many ideas you've come up with. And this is like just a sheer output. It could be all the ideas are terrible, but you've thought of a lot of them. That's at least something good. There's flexibility, which looks at the categories. So again, in terms of what I can do with this, if everything I say is just using it as a weapon, that's maybe a lot of ideas, but one category. Whereas saying using it as a weapon and then using it to prop something up is two categories. So it's more types of ideas. Originality is how rare is the response? How unusual, how original? It has to be relevant. But if I were to have 200 people come up with uses for a pencil, some of them, almost everybody would come up with using it to write. Others, only one or two people would come up with. And most are somewhere in the middle. That's kind of looking at originality. And this is one of those it can be used as an exercise. We also use it sometimes to test people, although there are problems with that. Once you've come up with many, many different ideas, that's when you evaluate them. This is also called convergent thinking. This is going through all the different ideas and thinking, which is the best idea? It could be what's the most creative idea, what's the most practical idea. Sometimes the best solution may be only a little bit original. So if you have a stopped up toilet, if you have a plunger, use the plunger first. You only work on really inventive and outlandish solutions if you don't have a plunger or your plunger doesn't work. I mean, if I have a hole in the wall, if I have spackle and paint, that's probably the best solution. It's if you don't, or if that doesn't work, that's when the originality really comes in. And then finally, you try it out. Did my solution work? If it did, great. If not, you start over again. Talk a little bit about creativity and personality. There are five main personality traits. Do people know the big five? Um, so one is extroversion, introversion. You know, are, are you... It's like, are you a people person? But really, it's do you get energy from people or do people suck your energy out? So if you go out with friends, are you left feeling, yes, I want to go and party all night? Or are you thinking, oh, my God, I want to go out. I, I just want to go home and sleep for like 12 hours. And one of those will kind of ring true. And that is which way you probably tend. With extroversion and introversion, it tends to be more about the domain. They tend to both be present in creative people. Extroverts tend to do performing arts a little more. 
Introverts tend to be more drawn to science, some types of creative writing. Conscientiousness, which is both the ability to be organized and orderly, but also to work hard. So it's somebody who gets their stuff done um, on time. And that could be because they're working really hard to do it because they have meticulous planning or a mixture of both. Conscientiousness is a really weird one with creativity. Artists tend to be low on it. Scientists and business people tend to be high on it. It's one of the few that really shows this split. Usually, there might be a slight difference by domain, but generally, personality traits either are positively associated, negatively associated, or just nothing. Conscientiousness, it really depends on, on the domain, whether high or low is associated. There's emotional stability and agreeableness, which generally don't have a huge relationship to creativity. Scientists can be a little bit disagreeable, but not enough to go out and have you pick fights with people if you want to be a good creative scientist. The most important one is openness. And this can be conceptualized <coughs> as open to experiences or open to intellect, or of course, both. People who are really high on openness to experience are the ones who want to do new things. So this is the person who wants to travel, wants to try new foods, wants to meet people from different backgrounds, wants to bungee jump or whatever the current scary thing is to do. They want to challenge themselves with what they're doing. Openness to intellect is more somebody who likes debates. They like challenging themselves intellectually, going to museums, learning about stuff, finding out new, new things. Although openness is generally associated with all creativity, openness to experience is particularly associated with the arts. Openness to intellect is particularly associated with science. And this is actually relatively new stuff. I mean, the whole facet approach has been the last 10 years and creativity is starting to catch up recently. Whenever we, you think about personality as it relates to creativity or anything else, a lot of personality research argues that your personality doesn't change that who you are at 15 is basically who you are at 60. This is kind of debated, but what isn't emphasized enough is that regardless of you can change who you are, you can change what you do. So I have never been the most conscientious person, but that's why I have Google Calendar. I have all sorts of stuff that remind me when to do stuff and when I'm meeting with people, because before that, I would forget. And now I tend to not miss meetings, not because I'm conscientious necessarily, but because I have a physical manifestation of conscientious and I married a very conscientious woman who makes sure that I don't wander off in the woods. Um, and eventually I've gotten a little bit more conscientious. I think if we want to change, we can. So if you... For example, if you're introverted, but you really want to be extroverted, you may never be somebody who will be dancing on the rooftops, but you can get yourself to change a little bit if that's what you want. Motivation is another absolutely fascinating area, and this is where flow comes in a lot, because flow is so much intrinsic motivation. Generally, we tend to do things either because 
a personal enjoyment, and this is, again, the, the embodiment of flow. I mean, when you're in flow, you are really enjoying what you're doing. Or we do it for more external reasons. Money's a pretty big one. Um, grades, but it can also be praise. It can be to have a final product. So, you know, if you write a book, you could be doing it because you love writing. You could also be doing it because you want to have this finished book in your hand and say, look, I wrote this. You need both. Generally, intrinsic motivation is seen as being a little more important. What's interesting is that a lot of the stuff that we try to do to reward people is not very helpful. It's a little counterintuitive. Rewards can actually reduce intrinsic motivation. Part of it is that we just start misattributing. So if you have a little kid who loves reading and they're reading and reading, one popular thing in America is the class that reads the most books get it, gets a pizza party and they track all the books they read and they have the best intentions. And I've now seen both of my sons experience this and start reading a lot when it comes for pizza parties. The problem is that a kid who already loves to read begins thinking to themselves, well, I'm reading this so I can get a pizza party. And then the pizza party comes and goes and their love of reading may have gone down a little bit. They associate it with something to do in order to gain something, not something they do because they enjoy it. It's actually one way to train a dog is if your dog does something that you don't like, like it barks too much, if you start rewarding it for that behavior and then just get it trained and then stop, it's learned that it's rewarded for this bad behavior. And I mean, it works on kids too, but dogs will then stop doing it because they're not going to bark for free. They're used to a little doggy treat. This hasn't worked on our dogs, but it does work. Other things that can hurt intrinsic motivation, a lack of choice. If you think you're going to be evaluated, an audience, the type of feedback we give. So if you give feedback that is very aimed more at the person, so they give you an essay to read and you say, you are a bad writer, that will not help. You can critique the essay and you can say, these parts aren't great. This stuff can be improved this way. More person focused, as opposed to product focused, it's going to temper interest. In general, more passion is good. Loving, loving what you do is good. I mean, this is, I remember the first time I was, I was ever interviewed on television. They, for the last question, they summarized everything I had just said. And then they said, what else do you have to say? And I had nothing to say because they had just summarized everything I had said. And the only thing I thought of was love what you do, which sounds so cliche, but it's, also really does help creativity. We don't always have the luxury of loving what we do, but the more we can find ways of doing what we love, the better. We also need extrinsic because creativity isn't always incredibly enjoyable. There are always parts. I mean, if you've written something, proofreading it, is not fun. Proofreading sucks. You need extrinsic motivation to finish proofreading. And if you don't finish proofreading and you don't show anybody, it's not going to get done. I mean, the new Cambridge Handbook of Creativity is in the works and coming out soon. I had to go through the index today. Proofreading an index is the single most boring thing it is possible to do. If you don't do it, you have a really bad index. And that's the first thing people tend to turn to in a book.
Creativity and intelligence are often thought of as being virtually the same thing. They actually don't have a super high relation. They're correlated, but it's about 0.2. And honest creativity correlates about 0.2 with everything in the entire world. If you were to take creative performance on any task and give almost any other measure, you'll get some correlation. But parts of intelligence correlate more or less. And indeed, this otherwise strange slide, if you look at the rate of Nicolas Cage movies released per year, and you look at the number of people who drown in swimming pools, that's correlated 0.67. So when intelligence and creativity are correlated 0.2, that's not necessarily that impressive. The kind of odd thing is that you do have some theories that link creativity and intelligence, usually as being related but not the same. The theories of intelligence that are actually used in IQ tests Put it in weird places. So, for example, the most commonly used theory of intelligence puts creativity in something called long-term storage and retrieval. The logic is, is that you go back to what you've learned and then you pull it out at the time in a new way and has creativity, but that doesn't really convince me a whole lot. If you look at most IQ tests, there's no creativity there. I grew up with IQ tests. My parents developed them. I like IQ tests. They don't measure creativity. Another, another chance for questions before I go into tips and more applied stuff. And in the topic of creativity and personality, you mentioned about uh, openness, uh, conscientiousness, and the extroversion. How about the other two in the big five, like the and the emotional stability? Uh, that means there's no relationship or the previous research has some difference or inconsistent results. There is a very slight relationship between being creative just in science and being disagreeable. But there have been so many studies that have found no relationship that even though the study, one of the studies that found that I was a co-author on, I don't, I'm still not fully sold. I think the odds are that whatever effect agreeableness has, A, it's a hard one to measure because agreeable people tend to just endorse everything, but Because always, having used personality measures with most of my studies, it's usually no correlation. Um, and even though we found this one little finding at one point, I found so many non-significant. With emotional stability, it's a little bit of a can of worms. So this is more conflicting studies. Um, because it gets at creativity and what's called subclinical mental illness. So not schizophrenia, but schizotypy. Not bipolar, but hypomania, kind of lower level. And the research is so scattered on that. And the research is so badly done, to be very honest. As somebody who's done a lot of that really bad research, 
the first thing that I became known for in very small fields was work on creativity and mental illness and something called the Sylvia Plath effect. It's terrible work. About seven years ago, two colleagues and I collected data on about 16, 1700 people, whole bunch of creativity measures, whole bunch of mental illness measures, wanted to like end the debate. We got some papers out of it that were addressing other things. And then me and the other main co-author got busy for a while. And by the time we finally settled down to it, I was kind of sick of the topic. And we basically found nothing. We found a few things that were correlated, but there were so many variables we were analyzing that it was meaningless and it didn't tell a story. It was, I could not make sense of it other than that it was random variation and random error. And I just didn't feel like writing up a 45 page paper that said, look, we know nothing. Um, so we didn't publish, um, I think at the genius level, there might be a link. I think at the levels that anybody actually encounters, I think it's wildly hit or miss because it's too huge, very, very, not ambiguous, very hard to measure in multifaceted constructs. I mean, people always talk about, for example, bipolar and creativity, but then if you look at like manic depression, but if you look at regular depression, it tends to be negatively correlated with creativity. Anxiety, wildly hit or miss. Things like OCD, there's usually no relationship. ADHD, you have some studies that show a relationship and you have other studies that show that they have things in common, but they're not particularly related at the higher levels. Since it's something that people feel so passionate about, it's often done with an agenda. Most of the research that people talk about that links creativity and mental illness is done by people who study mental illness, not who study creativity. And so the way they measure creativity is so bad and embarrassing um, within creativity, we don't measure mental illness very well. So I used to give a lot of talks about this and I don't think we know a whole lot more than we knew 20 or 30 years ago, but there's a lot of false information out there. It was probably a very complicated way of answering that. Are there any other questions? <laughs> so some, ver some various creativity tips and other things that I find interesting. Inspiration is overrated. Everybody talks about inspiration. But if you look at what is most associated, it's so much domain knowledge, expertise, persistence, resilience. I mean, if you really look at who are the people we view as creative, and particularly high achieving creative, it's much more that they kept going and they kept working at it and they failed a whole bunch and they failed more and they kept persisting. It's a lot less, you know, thunderbolt of insight. I mean, that can happen, but it usually doesn't get you there. It just starts you there. We tend to think of creativity as being fun, and it is. 
But there's also a lot of the boring part, as we talked about a little bit for motivation. One of the tactics that is often suggested that can help is conceptual combinations. I mean, it, it's a lot of the areas I've ended up studying in, in my career are, in essence, combinations. I wanted to work with somebody, they didn't do creativity, and we just merged areas. Um, creativity and love, creativity and blank. Um, I am frozen in my view, but I'm hoping I'm not frozen. Can people hear me? Because everybody is frozen right now. I'm sorry, but I don't think I can hear you, but maybe you'll better start the program because uh, uh, we, we can't watch this video. Do you want to try a quick disconnect, reconnect? Um, maybe we can just come and come back again. Maybe try again. What? Uh, the video is freeze. Uh, we can't see the motion. Can we try? Do we start again? Yeah, let's just real quick see if we can't get video back. Um. If we, so you can so you can use it in everything from the arts. So there's a little chart, like a short story, how you can list ideas, merge them, pick and choose. It's also where inter interdisciplinary stuff comes in. It's really hard to do in interdisciplinary work. It tends to not be rewarded. You each speak your own lang language, so to speak. I mean, I've been in a couple of really excruciating high level, let's get a bunch of people together to talk about creativity, and nothing ever gets done because you have experts who don't want to listen to other experts who think they're experts, and you think you're an expert, and everybody ends up just clashing. You get some nice meals out of it. Um, when it works, though, usually at a smaller level, you can get some really neat things. You just have to be very... Willing to know what you know and what you don't know. It makes you have to boil down an awful lot of stuff to why is what you're doing important. And I wasn't able to do that, my boss at Educational Testing Service. It's something I've been focusing on a lot more now. There's a monorail in San Diego that takes you to see all the animals. It's a very large zoo. And it's called the Wagasa monorail. And if you ask them why is it called that, they will make an answer up. The reason is that when they were having a contest to name the monorail, one executive wrote Wagasa, W-G-A-S-A, and it stood for who gives a blank anyway. Who cares? It doesn't matter. So much of anything converge into who cares. One of the nice parts about interacting with people outside your area, interdis interdisciplinary stuff, is that if you can't explain why it matters, you need to learn to do, to do so. There's something that we like calling the Goldilocks principle in terms of feedback, where it, it's very easy to give feedback that's either too harsh, too soft. So too soft feels good. That's when you're just like, this is so creative, it's great. 
It's a lot easier to give that feedback. It's what most people want to hear. It also doesn't really help people. It's also pretty easy to be too harsh. Somewhere in the middle is that just right. That mix of giving feedback that's accurate and helpful, but that's also not pandering. That's not going too light and letting people stay where they are. A growing concept of interest is the idea of creative metacognition. So metacognition just alone is knowing what you know. It's knowing how, how much you need to study for a test. It's, it's knowing how much you know about something. Creative metacognition, we argue, has a couple of components. I mean, one is certainly knowing your creative strengths and weaknesses, knowing what you are creative at, knowing what you need to improve on more. Another part of it is knowing when to be creative. And that's something that we don't really talk about a whole lot. A lot of studies have found a certain anti-creativity bias that People in general, teachers, bosses, say they like create, say they like creative students or workers. But then if you ask them questions about people and you describe a creative worker or a creative student, they don't like that person. Now, a lot of that is that if a person doesn't know when to be creative or share their creativity, it can bring things to a halt. There are times to be creative and there are times to kind of put it on the idea parking lot and bring it back later. And one of the problems is that people vary. And that, so sometimes this means learning how to be creative Sometimes it learns, it's about learning how to wait and share at the right time. We're used to thinking about nurturing creativity, like helping Bruce Wayne become Batman. So Batman has a Batmobile, the Bat glove, the Bat belt, the Bat everything. We give, he needs the tools to be a superhero. And that tends to be the mindset. We need to help people be creative, encourage, nurture, and we do. But there are also people who are already, who are starting up here. The same way that Superman, from a different planet, he always has his superpowers. What makes Superman somebody who is helpful is that he can be Clark Kent when he needs to be. If you're Superman all the time, if you are super creative all the time, it can get intense. It can dominate things. It can derail things. Obviously, in general, creativity is good. My message is not don't be, don't be creative. But there are times when it's perfect, time, times when it's good, in times when it may not be helpful. I mean, if you're taking a standardized test, probably you don't want to be creative. You want to get the correct answer. And so for the kids or the workers who are more like Superman, who are always up, that's more about becoming Clark Kent and learning how to, how to control it. It's finding that sweet spot in feedback, in being creative, it's about balance. Any, any questions, thoughts?
Uh, as a researcher, I have a question, uh, although I'm not in the field of creativity, I'm thinking about uh, the measurement of the creativity, as you are also as mentioned, that is very difficult and uh, sometimes maybe unsatisfying uh, to measure the creativity. I think the fundamental uh, issue is uh, how, uh, how can we define the creativity? Is it ability or is it behavior or is it um, I mean, the outcome? So, uh, so if we define it in different ways, so maybe the, the measurement will be also different, but even uh, if it's the ability or it's a behavior, but who judge that is creative? And uh, just in my, uh, in my field, in management field, uh, a very standard way for us to, to measure the creativity and policy is that I just ask the supervisor, the direct supervisor to rate whether this employees are creative or not, whether it's originality, whether they can have a new ideas. But it all depends on this person's judgment, right? So maybe his supervisor is not so creative, but the judgment is wrong. So I, I would like to know your point of view on this issue. And it's, um, it's funny because in, in Organizational psychology, that is the main way to measure creativity. And it's not great. Because in addition to supervisors, maybe they know what creativity is, maybe they don't. Maybe they don't like the person. And we found that we tend to rate people more creative if we like them, if they're physically attractive. Um, if all, all sorts of stuff that have nothing to do really with creativity we find that a lot of bosses and teachers don't always know what it is. They have wrong ideas. I mean, divergent thinking is the most commonly used measure. So they have the open-ended questions and they score it for a number. And the problem is that it's a really artificial task. And that when you have questions like, what would happen if you could fly? People may not take it as seriously as they would if it felt relevant. It's also, even though it's been updated, it's very firmly in the 60s. Nothing involving technology, you know, you know, nothing involving really most domains. I mean, it has thinking, but it's not really relevant for a lot of what people actually would want to measure creativity for. There are some more what they call objective tests, like the remote associates test. By and large, they're measuring more intelligence. So it's like how you can connect words together, but it's very rooted in much more in intelligence. My Currently, my favorite way is what's called the consensual assessment technique which was devised by Teresa Amable in the 80s and 90s, but people have kept building on her work. It's when you get qualified experts, and this is a, that's a loaded phrase, but people with some level of expertise in the area, and you have the individuals you want to assess produce something creative in their area. So if you have workers, it would be like an inbox exercise type thing or a, you know, outline or plan. If it's um, science, it could be evaluating either a Vita, for example, which some people have done, or if it's younger, planning a science experiment. And then you would have, ideally you would have like professionals in the area, so professional scientists, professional artists, writers, in real life, that's kind of hard. So we tend to use graduate students um, who then evaluate everything everybody does. And the problem is that, I mean, the good thing is that experts tend to agree at a really high rate. And so if you have 200 people producing something, they'll tend to agree, These are the more, this is the more creative stuff, this is the less creative stuff. The problem is that it takes a lot of time, and the more expert somebody is, the less they want to be doing this. 
the future will be when we can, in essence, I think, train machines to be experts. We're not quite there yet. I think there's a ton of dangers in that, in that as soon as you have anything set, people will learn how to cheat the system. But we already have that and people already do. I mean, we have established personality tests, achievement tests, intelligence tests. These are all flawed, but they're used. And people know how to cheat the system and they still, the tests still kind of work. As long as they require actual human beings rating it, it's never going to take off. It's too much work. Some colleges have used it for admissions. They tend to be the really rich colleges. Part of it is also that IQ tests make a lot of money each year and personality tests make a lot of money each year. Creativity tests don't make a lot of money, those that exist. <laughs> test publishers, I mean, I've been, I have one commercial test out, I have a second one in the works. Most big test publishers view this as small potatoes. They're not gonna invest money in it. And so you have, I mean, it's the same way that most tests are still very behind techno technologically. I mean, most solid but not great video games have much better technology than the best IQ test or standardized test. In part because the video game companies pay a whole lot more. So you have something where the test companies aren't quite caught up yet and even when they do, creativity is going to be pretty low on the, prior, on the priority list. I don't think it's that far off, but I think we're going to need to see a nice synergy of things to happen. I mean, I was working with a guy who did machine learning, and since his fiance, her parents lived in my hometown, we would meet, and then he moved to the San Francisco. So I feel like if we'd had 20 more meetings, we could have whipped, whipped something out just in our spare time. But getting a professional person to do it and spend time on it would be a whole lot of money that, you know, that people who have it don't want to spend it on that. That's a depressing answer. Um, I have a question. Um, do you have a view on what's happening now with technology in, let's say, uh, fintech, financial uh, industries, the use of artificial intelligence and so on? Is that going to block the creative thinking in the business world? Only I just got why you're taking the mic back and forth. I actually had not put that together before. Um, only if people let it in that every time technology does a new leap, and this is, I mean, I've been an you know, expert or whatever, you know, for 15 years or so. And so I've been interviewed at various points in technology development. And people always want to hear technology is bad. Technology is killing creativity and that in the good old days when we had a big refrigerator boxes that we would play in. And yeah, there's something to that. I mean, certainly in education, we run the risk as we cut recess and playtime that we are kind of destroying something. But I also think there's an amazing potential there that it's a difference between consumers and creators and that if a company uses AI and technology as a crutch and as a way of not doing more stuff, then yeah, it's just going to not do great things. But I think a lot of companies that are more forward thinking and see it not as a way to cut corners or as a way to get an easier outcome, but instead as a way to 
build off of it? I think we're in a, I think we, we will see a larger potential from a larger high to a larger low, if that makes sense. You know, like the great companies will use these new tools to do great things. And the mediocre companies will use these tools to be less creative. Uh, it's, it's interesting, but on the other, on, on the other way of thinking, uh, I'm more interested in uh, the way you've been uh, presenting the whole sense about creativity. It sounds like, it seems like uh, all sorts of creativity can be a part of the learning processes. Uh, for instance, I would say, uh, let's say there was a, a consensus expert in a certain type of field, and someone really following, of course, with a certain type of uh, IQ, bright enough, not, not just uh, average, and, and just handing anyone, and, and really learning and replicating and put some arms of persistence and hard working and, and keep going. And uh, I, I'm saying that because I was uh, researching the Concordia I mean, Fine Arts program. They, they really discovered that uh, talents are not necessary. I mean, great painter like Picasso and all those people, when they are childhood, they are not painting uh, consistently in a very talented way until they are initiated by the uh, consensus artist. Uh, the master, and then they keep following and, and keep improving, and they they became a, a master. So there is a my sense is there is a learning, hardworking uh, process also initiated and motivated not only intrinsic but also by by a, by a master of most likely a few of them. Uh, because also observation, when, 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 when you see Picasso, when you see America, all those people are a process of becoming, like they have different stages, and then you see the, uh, the way they paint, maybe uh, very, not abstract in a sense, or not that um, but then there's a evolvement there. So, so in that sense, I, I think, uh, uh, what well, your, your sense of presentation, I, I think there's also a, there's a huge uh, learning process and also initiated by, by some, some master or some people. So, so what, what do you think of that? There have been, it's funny, much of the study on this is with science because there's more evidence for it in that um, they tend to look at Nobel Prizes because that's as close as you can to like documenting it. And there we have the person whose lab it was and did you work with somebody who won a Nobel Prize and they find a huge connection. It's a little like the nature nurture in that is that because you learn so much from the ma master or is that because the master introduced you to all of the colleagues you need to know or more likely some mix of both certainly the it's between that little c and pro c that having a good mentor even if it's not a master but a good mentor is so helpful. There tends to be about, and it's not as concrete as some people portray it, but there, there is generally this 10 year rule. It varies by domain, it's not, you know, but the clock tends to start not necessarily at the mini C level, closer to little c. So when Picasso was a kid, and I shouldn't talk about Picasso because I don't know a whole lot about Picasso. I like his stuff, but I don't know his, his, his life as well. But usually the stuff that, let's say, an artist does as a kid, it may show talent, but it's not going to be, you know, amazing. It's usually about 
the first time they do something that is, okay, this is in some way notable, that it's about 10 years until they do something that is an actual contribution, you know. So the first painting that was considered decent to their first painting that would be in a museum type thing. For the, there was an analysis then of, actually this was of writers, so they looked at their first recognized good work and then what's considered their masterwork, that was at least another 10 years, sometimes more. So you would see this kind of, you know, 10 years towards making your mark, and then usually for most fields, another at least 10 years before doing the thing that you're most remembered for. Um, so it's absolutely this evolving process. Um, I mean, I think it's why, I don't know if, um, if anybody's heard of, of William Shockley. He was a Nobel Prize winning scientist who invented the transistor. Usually changing fields is a good thing. Not the changing, but expanding your scope. Shockley got interested in intelligence and IQ and subscribed to a lot of kind of racist and eugenicist thought. And the last chunk of his life was mostly devoted to that. And so if this was his curve, he then just went like this. And he's remembered either as the inventor of the transistor or as being this person who believes some pretty creepy things. So a lot depends on when that curve, does it keep going? Do you expand in this positive trajectory or do you, you can also just stay stagnant? I mean, you have a lot of people who hit a certain level and they're fine, but they don't do that last bump up, whether it's something really new, whether it's something that's a culmination or an example of something, but whatever that last bit is that would make them be great, they say it very good, which is fine. But you, if you don't keep evolving, if you look at the people who are remembered for great contributions in most fields, they also did a whole bunch of them. They weren't all great, but it's the people who kept producing and kept doing something all throughout. The people who are true one-hit wonders are actually more rare. Usually people who have some success either kept going or they died young, but, you know, that's usually the main reason, like, Bizet and Carmen, I mean, if he'd lived another 20 years, he would have written another six, seven operas, and he already had a couple of operas before that. Um, and heck, Mozart died in his 30s, and, you know. Uh, hopefully, we will take the last question. Anyone? Okay. 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 Thank you, Professor Kaplan. Uh, let us uh, give another round of applause to Professor Kaplan. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to say some words to the audience? Thank, th uh, thank you for getting up early on a Saturday, or at least reasonably early on a Saturday, and and the questions and attention and. Um, I've gotten really into creativity and meaning. So the next step that I do will be like creativity and meaning in life and stuff like that. Oh, that's great. Actually, we had another seminar on meaning in life. So probably we can link to it. Actually, it's in part based on, the, in, in part, was it Steger who was there? Yeah, Michael Steger, yeah. Um, a paper that's about to come out is building off of his work and his two colleagues and extending it to create to creativity and giving examples of how you can use creativity to pursue meaning. We haven't done, we haven't done the research yet, but I, you know, at least we have the theory. Yeah, we look forward to uh, reading this work. Uh, uh, and uh, we are so grateful to have uh, Professor Kaplan uh, uh, on another side of the world and uh, 
uh, share his knowledge and expertise with us. Actually, it's, the process is not easy. About an, a year ago, uh, we tried to invite him to Hartman, but at that time, he would like to come, but he couldn't because he just had his back pain and heart surgery. Uh, so he introduced another uh, speaker for us, kind of uh, his co-author on the book of uh, Neuroscience of Creativity. So, um, but somehow we haven't heard from that another speaker. So, uh, on April, uh, Professor Kaufman uh, accepted our invitation, but he couldn't travel, had a long distance travel, but he could deliver a virtual seminar to us. So, but um, last week, a uh, few days ago, actually, he still had a bad cold and uh, was taking anti antibiotics. You can feel that he, he still has some nasal congestion and yeah, the voice, yeah. So, and we are uh, so thankful to him because he, 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 he would like to stay up late on a Friday evening and uh, share with us, yeah. So, let's give another second. We also give a big hand to the audience as well. Thank you, thank you. So, um, thank you so much. And uh, so, uh, we hope you have a good night and uh, enjoy your weekend and uh, nice weekend and uh, have Hope you get well soon, okay? We'll keep in touch. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.